All right, welcome to, uh, this is April 8th, and this would be your final lecture for uh, Holy Week. And we've been talking about the, the liturgical movement of Holy Week as, as an opportunity to think about the transformative capacity of the gospel to shape and form us in meaningful ways uh, to be transformed thoroughly uh, by the gospel and the call to, to reconciliation. And we finished off talking about the prayer in the garden and then the realism that is going to be necessary for us to understand that even some of the relationships that we've forged throughout the years probably won't see us through even as we engage the call to racial reconciliation, which we believe to be at the heart of the gospel. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about Holy Week is this idea that as Jesus is betrayed and as he's taken on trumped up charges, that he refuses to lash out, which is a refusal to, to trade evil for evil. Um, and, and one of the things that I want to suggest here, and, and this is part of what I wanted you to wrestle with, the idea of, of moral suasion versus militant aggression. At what point, and is it possible for a gospel follower to become militantly aggressive or violent in pursuit of the ends of, of racial justice or racial equality? And I am still convinced, even after reading, recognizing my own privilege and being able to say these things, uh, that there is something about the gospel that wants to avoid supporting in any way the myth of redemptive violence the re myth of redemptive violence is that saying suggesting in some way that violence can be used to right violence right and that that can make things right now that is not to suggest and, and if you take my class in the fall we're going to deal with just war theory which i i still have problems with even in con within the context of the church uh but but in terms of there may be at points evils in this world that require some sort of uh violent uh intervention maybe uh but well, I want to suggest in terms of reconciliation, violence that begets violence that plays into the myth of redemptive violence uh, doesn't uh, create the pathways for reconciliation necessary. Um, it may level the playing field for a while, but the deeply embedded and, and um, uh, the, the deeply held uh, animosities will remain uh, through through the use of violence. Jesus refuses to do that. In fact, he refuses violence. He refuses to call down legions of angels that could have devastated everything, but it chooses instead to suffer and to sacrifice and to continue to act out of love and nonviolence, um, bearing witness to the goodness of the kingdom that though he, no one around him understood would would be validated through through what happens through the resurrection. Then we move to the cross, which I sort of alluded to this in the first lecture as we talked about James Cohn and the lynching tree. Uh, but this, I, this understanding of the cross is more than just, again, purchase of my individual salvation for heaven, which is the recognition really that, that the cross may be at the point at which God most fully identifies with victims of unjust suffering. Now think about this. On the cross, Jesus quotes Psalm 22, where it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It could be in that moment that he's giving voice to the, the countless voices that have suffered unjustly at the hands of the powerful and privileged. And maybe it's there on the cross that Jesus identifies most fully with those who have suffered uh, suffered as a result of unjust victimhood. Um, I think he, I mean, cross also democratizes the need for forgiveness. Uh, everybody's present at the cross. You've got betrayers and deniers and you have uh, Roman centurions and you have Jewish leaders like the the need for forgiveness extends and everyone at some level is held culpable right at the foot of the cross everyone is held culpable and I think this is also really important for us to understand especially as we move into this understanding of systemic injustices Sys understanding systemic justice does not condone uh evil behavior so so one, one can understand the systemic environmental nature that creates systems by which gangs and gang violence can emerge and yet the person through which it emerges should still be held culpable and we cannot condone evil behavior simply because of the systemic injustice because at the cross it it reminds us that everyone is held accountable for the actions and deeds that they participate in especially when they take advantage of the well-being and they hurt others um and then and then one of the things that i want to say is 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 that the cross is that place for commonality everybody's on equal ground at the cross no one can sit on their high horse at the at the foot of the cross and then i want to talk to you a little bit about holy saturday holy saturday is the day between the cross and the resurrection and holy saturday is i think a part of the journey of racial reconciliation holy saturday is when when we feel like nothing is happening uh, like we're not getting any headway in fact uh, reading uh, Brenda Salter McNeil she talks about seasons in which she felt like 
uh, is any good even coming of the work that she was doing? Um, Holy Saturday is, is actually the Sabbath for the Jews, and so they couldn't do anything. And so Holy Saturday is those moments when we don't feel like we can do enough. Like there's just not enough that we can do to impact the call for racial reconciliation. When we feel as though uh, all we can do is lament, uh, there are seasons and moments in terms of racial reconciliation when we see the unjust treatment. I'm going through one personally right now as I think about the suffering of black communities through the pandemic, which is being shown over and over again that um, disproportionately uh, African Americans are suffering through COVID and the deaths uh, more than any other uh, more than any other demographic um, within the United States. And there's a sense of lament because I'm really not sure what I can do at this point. I, it feels like Holy Saturday for me, just personally, because here I am, Chicago. I want to make I want to do the work that matters, and and yet I still feel like somehow I'm missing something or not able to do something. So right now I'm just sort of choosing to lament at this point because I don't know that there's much more that I can do in this moment. And then we can move to the resurrection. We talked about the resurrection. We understood the theological uh, nuances of racial reconciliation very early on, and I'm not going to rehearse all of that. But resurrection is really the vindication of love over hate, a hope over despair, and God's capacity to reconcile even when evil did its best to snuff out uh, God's willingness to reconcile. Um, and so we need to understand the resurrection within that regard. But what I want to talk to, uh, what I want to suggest to us here is that what I've walked you through, through Holy Week, there can be some creative ways in which you can liturgically create opportunities for your people to think through how racial reconciliation, the call to justice, the call to equality, the call to, to the mutual flourishing of humanity uh, can be lived out. What I've also included in this, this, this week's lectures is an example of a Good Friday liturgy that I wrote several years ago that really calls people into account for our participation in systemic injustices and uh, the sinfulness and the, the fragility of the human killer, character and the fickleness of the human heart. Um, that, that, that's there that you can also look, you can download, maybe use it in the future. That's up to you. It's, it's there for your use. Um, I want to finish by just kind of quickly walking through the movements that I think emerge from what I've just shared. And I think this sort of begins to pave the path as we engage systemic uh, racism, but then also as we look to uh, the road the road ahead, which is going to be our last week of lectures. Um, one is confronting and naming injustice. Okay, Number two is identifying within each person the Imago Dei, recognizing that, that reconciliation only ever happens when dignity is afforded and the Imago Dei is recognized and understood in each person. Number three, when, we, when we're willing to abandon our status, when we, we're willing to come off the high horse, when we stop trying to um, rise to some sort of level of, of importance or in, in I think it's Toni Morrison's words from our presentations, um, if I only feel tall when someone's on their knees then I have not yet abandoned my status. When we've got to empty ourselves of our presumption and privilege and that is an ongoing effort from each of us um, in every regard of our lives that we have to be constantly aware of the ways in which I don't care if it's our color, our education, our wealth, whatever it is that sort of gives us this sense of presumption and privilege we have to be able to empty ourselves of that. We have to identify with the lowly. We have to be in presence, shared proximity with those uh, who find themselves at the margins of society. Uh, we have to pray fervently. Um, I do believe that prayer is a part of the kind of necessary spirituality for activism that creates the possibilities for life. Um, we have to live tinged with realism, knowing that even in terms of the relationships that we live in, not all of them will work out well. Um, we have to refuse evil for evil. Uh, we have to be willing to take into our lives the violence that we refuse uh, to then uh, dish out and, and divvy up to others. Uh, we have to suffer in hope. Um, and, and that's what suffering for a Christian is not simply suffering. It's suffering in hope. hope. Hoping that God finds ways even in the suffering to redeem, restore, and validate what has what the suffering has meant. And then finally, the sort of dying to the self, which is an ongoing process for all disciples, but specifically within the call to reconciliation. We will not persevere in this call to right the wrongs that exist in our society if, if, if this is only a once in a while kind of thing. This has got to move down into the depths of our souls and only through the dying of ourself is that possible. So I pray for you as you engage this Holy Week, as you move towards Good Friday, as you enjoy 
uh, the celebration of the resurrection on Sunday, think about, dream about, imagine the ways in which the liturgy of the church can inform the congregational life so that we can more faithfully engage the call to racial reconciliation. God bless you. Have a happy Easter, and I will talk to you after Easter.